everybody is trying to live the life, aren't we? We are all trying to live the life, a life of abundance, aren't we? When we think of an abundant life, most of us, we began to think of gaining so much money, don't we? We start to think about gaining so much wealth that we can live comfortably and not have to worry about a thing, don't we? And so what is it that we have done? What is it that we do to live that life of abundance? We were told to get a degree. And if we are unable to get a degree, we were told to get a certificate of some kind that can show that we can do something. We were told that we should take that degree and that certificate and we should get a job with it, that we should find a job in a successful, and I use air quotes there, in a successful career field. And then we were told that when we do those things that we should go out, that we should find the one that we should get married and that we should start a family. And then we should take that family and that, that job and that successful career and that we should go out and that we should get a house, not any kind of house until we should go out and we should get that house that has the white picket fence. And, and when we do those things, we can live the life. We can live the dream. In my story, I got the degree. I landed a job that could have been in a successful career field. But then I gave it all up to start up a business with my brother because, hey, they say, hey, start up a business as well. And when things seemed to be going well for us, we started to pick up some really good clients. We started to make a decent kind of, of money. Life happened for me. Life, it hit me and it hit me hard. My kidneys, they said, no, 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 you go no further. My kidneys, they failed. I believe that some, they will look at me now. They will see whether I am today. And they will say that you ain't living the life, pastor. They will say, pastor, you are not living an abundant life because they will look and they will see what I don't have. I don't have wealth. I don't travel. I'm not married. I don't have a, uh, a wife, I don't have a house that has a, a white picket fence as well. I don't have a fancy car, I don't have fancy clothes. They will say again, pastor, you not living the life. But I tell you that after my kidney failure, my outlook on life, it changed. I began to look at life a lot differently. You see, I was no longer concerned about building an empire. I was no longer concerned about getting filthy rich. That was not what was on the pastor's mind. All I wanted to do was to live. I wanted to be able to appreciate Life and, and I began to learn to enjoy and to appreciate what it was that God had given to me. And it's been nearly 10 years now since that has happened. And since I have gotten a, a kidney transplant during that time frame, nothing has changed. In fact, it has been cemented for me to look at life a whole lot differently and to where nowadays I have learned to appreciate God's beauty. While I may have my concerns and while I may have my worries, while some things may make me a bit excited, a bit anxious, if you will, 
I have learned today to seek those moments to where I can again laugh and rejoice to where I can enjoy God's abundance. I feel that many of us today that we are missing out on the beauty of life because our focus is elsewhere. Our focus is on the wrong things. And so because our focus is elsewhere, because our focus is on the wrong things, we are unable to appreciate life. We are unable to appreciate, we are unable to see what it is that God has given to us, what it is that is right before us. So to teach us about what's important in life, Jesus, he shares an example with us today through the giving of sight to a man that was born blind. I'm going to have you turn back to the ninth chapter of John's gospel for me there. And in the ninth chapter of John's gospel in the first few verses there, taking a look at the first through the seventh verse there, we are going to see where we are introduced to this blind man. And there in the second verse, we'll see there that Jesus's disciples, they wanted to know if this man who was born blind, if he was born blind because of sins, his parents had committed, or maybe he had did something. I guess they may have thought here before he was even born into the world. They wanted to know if he or his parents messed up was the reason as to why he was born blind. But when we take a look at the third verse there, we'll see there that Jesus he shook his head no to his disciples. And Jesus, he said to them that his blindness would reveal the glory of God. The glory of God, you should know, it breathes life. It breathes life into this world. It breathes life into those who choose to receive his glory. Have you chosen to receive his glory today or are you missing it? And so in the scripture there, we'll see that Jesus, he came to the man. He made some clay. We're told there in the scripture and we're told there that he anointed the man's eyes with the clay that he had made. And we'll see there that Jesus, he directed him. He gave him some directions and we'll see that after the man followed Jesus's directions, after he washed in the pool of Siloam, the man were told that he came back with visual sight. His vision had been restored there. So let's be clear about this. In the opening of the ninth chapter there, we'll see that Jesus, that he gave this man something that no medicine. He gave this man that something that no doctor, no, no wealth, no money, nor power could give to this man. Yes, he gave the man vision. Yes, he gave him visual sight here. But what I want you to see here today is that this man was given joy. This man, he will rejoice over what it was that Jesus gave to him. And what it was that Jesus had gave to him was life. Jesus has given this man life and joy in his soul. Now, you would think that that's such a miracle. You would think that it would have been celebrated. You would think that those that were around him, that they would have rejoiced over the fact that this man has been given sight. But we'll see there in the 10th verse that the man's neighbors, that they were left wondering how his eyes had been opened. And we'll see there that the man, he testified of Jesus's handiwork there. And after he testified of Jesus's handiwork, we'll see there that his neighbors, they brought him to the Pharisees there. 
And we'll see there that the Pharisees almost immediately, they began to speak against his healing. They began to speak against the miracle here. We'll see that in the 16th verse that the first thing the Pharisees did was to speak against Jesus. They said that in that scripture that, that Jesus, that he wasn't a man from God. And the reason why they said that Jesus wasn't a man from God was because Jesus, that he didn't keep the Sabbath. Then we'll see that, that they accused the, the formerly blind man of having not really been born blind. Imagine that. If you take a look at the 18th, the 19th, the 20th, and the 21st verse there, you see that it got so bad that the Pharisees, they had to go to his parents just to verify that this man was born blind. They couldn't believe it. They couldn't accept it. They couldn't see. Then we'll see that, that they came back to the formerly blind man there in the 24th verse. And they said to him, give God the glory. What did they think he was doing? <laughs> they said to him, give God the glory. And I imagine that he said, hey, what do you think I'm doing? They said there, we know that this man, speaking of Jesus, we know that this man is a sinner. They said there, they have failed here. They have failed to see that God's glory was standing right there. God's glory was standing right there before them. And so in response to them, we'll see there in the 25th verse, that the formerly blind man of Jesus, he said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. But one thing I, I do know, the man said there, that though I was blind, now I see. Is what he said there. And again, the Pharisees, they failed to see what was standing before them. Why could they not see God's glory was standing right before them? In the 28th verse, the scripture, it tells us that they had reviled the man because they saw him as a disciple of Jesus, where they were Moses's disciples. Now, for us astute Bible studiers, for us who study scripture day in, day out, we know the word of God. We know that Jesus and Moses, we know that there is no difference. We know that Jesus and Moses, we know that they are on the same page, that they are not apart from one another. We, we know that Moses, that he heard from the Lord and that, that Moses would share the word that he got from God. And we know that Jesus, that he is the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word was made flesh and dwelt among his people, his creation. So in the Pharisees here, we see a problem a problem that still stands today in the Pharisees here. We see the self-righteous all knowing mindset that blinds and it keeps many today from being able to live the life to live an abundant life because they are unable to see the abundance to be able to live it. And so Jesus, he would go on to call the Pharisees there in the 41st verse. He would go on to call them blind. And not only does he call them blind there, we'll see that Jesus said that sin, that it was found in them and that sin, it remained in them. And so because their sin remained in them, they blinded themselves from seeing what's most important when it comes to living in this world today. Are you blinding yourself from seeing what's important in life? Again, many of us today, 
Our attention isn't what it should be on. Our focus is elsewhere as we are trying to live the life. But many of us, we find a great deal of struggle in living the life. You see, man will say, do this, do that. And you too can live the life. Yet the same ones will make living the life a, a living nightmare. If you try to do this and do that, as they say, pastor ain't going to get no amen. No, now, I certainly understand trying to live a life of comfort because you better believe that, that we deserve it. And Lord knows we deserve to live a life of comfort. We have gone through enough. Haven't we? However, I want you to understand today that if you desire to live the life more abundantly, if you desire to live life more abundantly, you won't ever be able to do so following a way that is blind to true abundance. You will not live an abundant life if you're living in a way that is blind to the abundant life. I hope you hear me here today. So when we turn over and we look at the 10th chapter of John's gospel, we'll see that in the 10th chapter of John's gospel that Jesus, he sets out, he sits out to further teach this incredibly important lesson about the abundant life. He sits out to, to teach us what the abundant life is and how one can go out and lay hold of it, how one can go out and obtain that life of abundance. And Jesus, he began by sharing an illustration there in the opening of the 10th chapter there of a shepherd coming to his sheepfold in comparison to a thief and a robber. Jesus, he says there in the opening six verses there in the 10th chapter that the shepherd enters the right way to the sheepfold while a thief and a robber will sneak in some other kind of way. Jesus said there that the shepherd knows his sheep by name, leaves his sheep, goes before his sheep as well. And something that we should understand there about the opening six verses there in the 10th chapter of John's gospel is that Jesus, he was speaking of himself. He's speaking of himself coming to his flock in comparison to others, to those who may try to come another way. But you see this group, the blind man and those Pharisees there, they, could not understand the illustration. And so we get to my response of reading for today, there in the seventh through the 21st verse, where we'll see that Jesus, he moved to make the illustration plain, is what we'll say. He moved to make this illustration easier for, for us, for people to be able to understand. We'll see that in the seventh verse that Jesus, he very pointedly, he said to them, most assuredly, I am the door of the sheep. There goes that door again. We've been looking at that door all year long, haven't we? You see, shepherds, they would act as a door by standing in the opening of the sheepfold. There was no physical door that could open and could shut to let sheep out. So the shepherds, they would stand in the entrance and, and they would act as the door. They would do this to protect their flock from wandering out, going astray and getting lost. They would also do this to protect their flock from predators from trying to come in. 
So Jesus was very pointedly saying that in the seventh verse that he protects the life of his sheep so that they can have life. Amen. Jesus, in other words here, is saying that if you are of his foe, he stands in the entrance to keep you from wandering out and losing your life. He stands there in the entrance to keep the, the predator from being able to enter in and take your life. Jesus is your protector. Now, we know that doors that they not only remain shut, but we know that doors that they can open up as well, which would mean that Jesus in your life, he will do more than protect your life. See, when, when we say that a door opens to us, we often mean that a door is opening up to new opportunities for us, aren't we? We, we typically mean that doors are opening up to our dreams, our wishes, and, and our hopes. And, and for us to be able to go out and to fulfill our dreams, to fulfill our wishes to fulfill our hopes, to take on those new opportunities. So as the door, Jesus, he is, I want you to understand today, the door to our opportunities. Jesus, he is the door to your dreams, to your wishes, to your hopes, to you being able to live that life of opportunity. Now, there are those who, just like the Pharisees, they believe that they can close and slam a door shut on you. You see, if you go back and you take a look at that ninth chapter in the 34th verse there, you will see where the Pharisees, they actually had the audacity to cast out the blind man, to cast him out and to slam the door shut on him. Many of us, we have had doors slam shut to our face, haven't we? We've had them slam shut to us by someone who believes that they have the authority to slam that door on us, to, to ban us, to keep us out from dreams and from wishes and from opportunities. Some of us, when that has happened, we have hung our heads. Some of us, we have given up because a door was slammed shut. Should we hang our heads in defeat when a man slams the door on us? As I said, some of us, we try to live the life. We try to live that good old dream. That American dream is what they'll call it. And we try to do it the whole time while being pressed down, while being despised, while being hated, while being mistreated. Many of us, we have put up with so much. We have put in so much hard work in our life only to be met with misery and with great struggle. Yeah. I want to point something out to you today when somebody call himself closing a door on you. If you take a look there at the 35th verse there in the ninth chapter of John's gospel, you will see that something happened after the Pharisees, after they cast the man out. The scripture tells us that, that when the Pharisees cast out the formerly blind man, that Jesus immediately found the man. And Jesus, he asked the man here, do you believe in the son of God? Again, I want to point out Jesus 
found the man immediately after he heard that the Pharisees called themselves casting him out, excommunicating him, closing the door shut on him because, hey, you one of Jesus's followers. They, they mistreated this man. They did him wrongly and Jesus was right there. I don't know if y'all get what I'm getting at right now. Jesus was right there, I said. I said that they cast him out, and I said that Jesus was right there. You done never had a door slam shut on you, and you done been cast out. Jesus was right there. I don't know if y'all see what I'm getting at. But, but they done closed the door on me and thought they done kicked me out. But Jesus was right there. You see, Jesus, he was opening up another door for this man. And the door that I want you to understand Jesus was opening up here was a door to a far better opportunity than what man could have gave to that formula blind man. Man hadn't opened up his eyes. They hadn't given him sight. Jesus did that. No money, no wealth, no power did that for the man. Jesus did that. And they called himself closing the door on him. Don't be trying to close no door on me when Jesus has already did for me. You see, we must remember that Jesus said that he is the door. And we must remember that when one door closes, another one going to open up. And you know who's going to open up that door for you? He is right there. Jesus will certainly open up another door and he will give you life. And so from this thought, we'll take a look at the 10th chapter again. And we take a look at the eighth verse there. Jesus, he said to the blind men and those Pharisees who called themselves kicking them out and, and shutting the door on the blind man. And Jesus, he said there in the eighth verse, all whoever came before me are thieves and robbers. Now this was a statement that was directed at, at false prophets. It was directed at, false teachers like those Pharisees right there that call themselves kicking a the man out when this man had been blessed by the Lord. You see such people, I want you to understand today that they pose a threat. Those who call themselves closing doors on you, they, they pose a serious threat. As Jesus warned in the first part of my key verse there in the 10th verse, the thief does not come except to steal to kill and to do what else? The thief comes to do only a few things, Jesus said there. And, and none of those things are to help you out. Uh-oh. It ain't to help you out. Jesus again said there, the thief comes to steal to kill and to destroy. What is it that the thief is trying to steal? Our dreams, our wishes, our aspirations, our hopes. They try to take away our opportunities as well. Better watch out for that thief. Now, what is it that they are trying to destroy? In the 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel in the 13th verse of the scribes and the Pharisees, and Jesus, he said to the people about them, woe, for they, the scribes and Pharisees, they shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. Think about what that means trying to shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. See, to shut up the kingdom of heaven is an attempt to close the doors to that 
everlasting peace and that everlasting joy, which is life more abundantly. That peace and joy is that life more abundantly. And so again, that in the ninth verse, Jesus, he repeated there to this group, I am the door. However, I want you to pay very close attention to what Jesus said, what he added on there in the ninth verse, where Jesus said, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. He again said, if anyone, to be clear, anyone, that's speaking to the fact that both Jew and Gentile have been welcomed to enter in by Jesus. To be saved, Jesus said there. Because again, he said, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. To be saved and to then go in and out and find pastor, that speaks to a certain kind of life. We're talking about living the life today. Uh oh, Jesus is about to start talking about living the life now. You see, this is this is what led Jesus to say again in the rest of my key verse there in the 10th verse, I have come that they, that is anyone, may have life, and that they may have it life again there more abundantly. Again, I want you to pay close attention there. Jesus didn't say that he came to destroy, did he? Jesus didn't say anything about coming to throw anybody into eternal condemnation. Jesus said that he came so that they, that again is anyone, Jew and Gentile, may have life and may have it, life, more abundantly. Jesus, he desires for you to not only have life, but to have it more abundantly. And to make sure that this happens, Jesus, he's going to tend to you. He's going to care for you. Jesus, he's going to let you into his pasture. Jesus, he's going to watch over you so that you can dwell in his pasture freely. Now, I want to make a note there about what we see there in the ninth, and then especially there in my key verse, in the 10th verse there. Jesus, he didn't say anything about coming to give us earthly riches, did he? Jesus, he didn't say anything there about coming to give us wealth, did he? He didn't say anything about money. He didn't say anything about power. And then he didn't say anything about no kind of titles. You know, we love to, to have our titles. Jesus didn't say anything about coming to give to give any of that. See, while man may desire those things in life, they are not what life is all about. You see, again, we can't see what life is all about. We can't see the beauty of this life that God has given us. Because our attention is always on the wrong things today. Our focus is elsewhere. We need to turn our attention back to life and trying to live life more abundantly. And so in order for us to do this, we must know what life is. In order for us to know what life is, to be able to live life more abundantly, we must go back to the source today. And in order for us to go back to the source, that means that we need to, to go back to God. And, and we need to be taking a look at, at what God has to say, rather than those folks that like to go out and say, do this and do that, and then make life trying to do this and do that a living nightmare. We need to go back to the source. And so when we go back to the beginning, all the way back to the first chapter of Genesis, when God created life, the scripture shows us there that he looked at all that he created 
from the, the heavenly bodies, the heavenly lights, all the way down to the green herb for food, the Lord looked at it and he said that it's all good. All of it is good is what the scripture shows us there. God, when he created life, he created life from a place of, of care. He created life from a place of love. Then God, he created mankind. And, and when God created mankind, as my dad would say, God, he took his time forming mankind. I don't know if he spent all that much time on man. But I know God was delicate when he came to creating a woman. God, he, he created us from a place of, of tenderness. That tender love, it kind of hit different, don't it? That's the kind of love that God created us in. And so God, he inserted us. He inserted mankind into his creation. And then God, he did something different with us. He breathed into mankind's nostrils the breath of life. And man, we became living souls. This is what scripture tells us. And, and when God, when he created us, he created us with that same old desire that you have heard me speak of before. He created us with the desire that we be fruitful and that we multiply that we flourish and that we prosper. He created us to, to dwell with life and to have dominion over it. Dominion means to, to reign. But in this sense here, we should understand that, that man was to reign as God reigns. And you see, the Lord, he reigns with love. He reigns with care. The Lord, he reigns with tenderness in heart. So when we trace life back to its source, let's understand that life, that it is moving. That life, it is flowing. Life, it is breathing. Life, it is nourishing. Life, it seeks to grow. Life it seeks to flourish in every direction. At its core, life, we need to understand today that life, it is tender. Life, it is precious. Life, it is caring. Life, it is filled with love. At least it was before sin entered in. You see, sin, it is a thief and a robber. Sin, it seeks to rob us of life. You see, sin, it's already stripped and robbed man of the glory that we was created in when we gave in to sin, when we listened to sin. Sin, it, it tarnishes the beauty of life, the beauty of, of God's creation. And all we are left with today is decay and death. Where death is, there can be no life. Where death moves, there can be no dreams, there can be no hope. This is why Christ needed to be born in this world. This is why God gave the world his only begotten son, the greatest gift. Because again, God's desire is for man to be able to move, to be able to breathe, and to be able to flourish, and to be able to rejoice without suffocating and drowning in sin and in death. That's what we are doing today. Many of us, we are trying to live the life, but we're suffocating and we're drowning in sin and in death. You see, Jesus, he said there again that he is the good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd that helps us to be able to live life. He watches over us and he keeps us. He protects us. And then he gives us life more abundantly in his freedom. When you wonder what 
is abundant life. Abundant life is being able to live free from sin. Abundant life is being able to live free from death because Jesus frees us from the penalty of sin, which is death. Abundant life is being able to, again, live free from that guilt and the burdens of being a sinner because we are justified of our sins, again, through the giving of the only begotten Son of God. Abundant life is being free from, from the trials and the tribulations that try to weigh us down in our soul because Jesus has taken those trials and those tribulations off of our shoulders. Abundant life is being able to flourish in every direction without the threat and the hindrance of sin holding you back. Abundant life is being able to rejoice not only in your blessings, but being able to see life as a blessing that others, those you know and those that you do not know, that they too can rejoice in the blessings of the Lord as well. You see, this is what we are missing out on today. Trying to live the life doing this and doing that as evil man says. We miss out on living the life and then we begin to move in a way that is filled with nothing but decay and death. Many of us today, we are robbing ourselves from peace, joy, and God's wonderful blessing of love because we are too enamored with the flesh and living as the world would dictate we live rather than living as God has said that we ought to live. So I want to be clear today that I'm not preaching this message because I stand against money and wealth because again, we should desire to live comfortably in this world. We should desire to live life. We should desire to be able to enjoy the, the fruits of our labor. However, I think of what Paul said when it comes to trying to live the life and, and living in this world. In the sixth chapter of first Timothy in the sixth through the 10th verse, Paul, he shared some words to Timothy that I believe we need to hear today. To Timothy, Paul wrote now godliness with contentment is great gain. He said, and having food and clothing, with these, we shall be content. Be content, Paul is saying there, with the blessings that God has given to you. Then Paul, he added on there, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Paul said, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed, listen to this, have strayed from the faith in their greediness. Again, missing out on what it is that God has sat right before us. You see, there's a line that we shouldn't cross today. The Pharisees, they had crossed that line. They had crossed that line where they couldn't even recognize that the blind man had been blessed by the Lord. They couldn't recognize that the blind man had been filled with joy, that he had been filled with life, that he was God's glory. They couldn't even see it. They were blind to it. In fact, if you take a look back at that ninth chapter of Judge's gospel after this message is over with, you'll see that the Pharisees, they didn't even realize that the man was singing praises to the Lord the whole time. Because their thirst and their hunger for that title, for that power and for glory and for control and authority over the kingdom, 
It had blinded them. I began to wonder today how many of us have gone blind because of our thirst and our hunger for these earthly riches. And then for having a title, for trying to be somebody. Everybody wants to live the life. We want to be somebody. My hope today is to persuade you to turn away from crossing the line where you don't even recognize the beauty of life. The beauty that God has given to all of us to be able to live in it. Through his only begotten son, the Lord has even put before us the opportunity of life more abundantly in his pasture. My hope today is that you will strive to lay hold of that, that life of abundance that has been promised to us by Christ himself, who said, all you have to do is enter by me. That's all we have to do. If you desire to enjoy life more abundantly today, all you have to do is enter by him. That means all you have to do is join into fellowship with the Lord with Christ. So today we must choose for ourselves today. We must choose for Christ to be our shepherd. I don't need sin to be my shepherd. I don't need the dreams of evil man to, to Lord over me to shepherd me. I want for God to be my shepherd because you see, I remember what David said. In the 23rd Psalm, when David spoke about how God was his shepherd, and that's the kind of life that I want. You see, in, in the 23rd Psalm, David said that with God as his shepherd, the Lord had restored his soul. David said that with God as his shepherd, that the Lord had anointed his hair with his oil. Meaning that the Lord had shielded and that the Lord had protected him. David has said that with God as his shepherd, when he was in this world, in the presence of his enemies. David said that, that God had filled up his cup to the point that his cup, as the King James translation said, his cup runneth. It runneth over. David was saying that with God as his shepherd, his every need was met and was supplied. David would tell you that in abundant life, in his pasture, your every need will be met, your every need will be supplied, and you will be able to live freely. No worries. No anxiety over what somebody is going to do to you. That's what David would tell you today. So again, I encourage you today, if you want to live the life, enter into fellowship with Christ. And when you enter into fellowship with Christ, I tell you today, yes, you may still have some struggles. Yes, you may still have some afflictions, but as your shepherd, he is going to lift you over your trials and your tribulations. He's going to get rid of those afflictions that you have. He's going to take them away from you. So again, I encourage you today, Look to Christ, look to him, and he will give you life. He will give you joy. He will give you peace. He will give you freedom. He will give you that life of abundance. Amen. 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 Amen.